I'm going to show you this video. It'll take me just a second. And this is what's going on inside of you, that when you worship God, when you go down the road, when you, when you go out to eat, and when you put stuff in your mouth, whatever it is, this is really what's going on inside of you. And it's, it's, there's not a lot of verbiage. It's just um, what takes place with epigenetic changing that's going on all the time. When we come back, we'll look at the rest of the cell dividing, but I just wanted you to remember this. What we do day in and day out affects people around us. We can tap into Almighty God through the Holy Spirit. What we do affects us at the molecular level also. The things that we do, if we operate according to God's design, is going to help us. It's not going to guarantee we're not going to get cancer. It's not going to guarantee that we're going to live to be 159. But what it will do is allow us to be the best we can be for Jesus. So we're usable for, to God, we're available to God, and we make a difference promoting the gospel around the world. So God bless you guys. You know, we left off talking about the idea of the life design protocols being something that we have to kind of ease into. I mean, you could, I guess, holistically jump in and revamp your entire life, although you're connected to other people, which makes it very difficult for them. But in, in doing this, I wanted to talk about a couple of things that are really important, and we're going to get into a little bit deeper stuff, and I just, just kind of take notes and pay attention. I know it's like after lunch, you're ready to take a nap, but um, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. No, um, So we're going to get started here, and the world has this special answers for all these problems, and we talked about that a little bit a while ago, and I, I wanted to read another thing that I thought might be interesting to you. <clears throat> It's developing a self-inquiry curriculum to promote spiritual maturation. Basically, trying to create a curriculum in the school system, college system, universities, to help people learn to spiritually mature, which I thought that was kind of interesting. So I, I want to create a classroom learning community with a trustworthy, listen to these words, interpersonal atmosphere and introduce structure contemplative experiences through which students could learn to engage proactively in psychological and spiritual growth. So they're talking about spiritual growth, but they're leaving out the main component, Jesus Christ. And as the world searches and grabs for this stuff, I think we have the best answers. And I think if we could demonstrate our answers through the incarnational life and the way we live our life, I believe that the world is ready to hear a gospel that really works. I believe the world is ready not just to hear verbiage, but to see the action of it, the fruit of it, which by the way, the fruit of what we're talking about is not just here and now, like I said, one and done. It actually is transgenerational. And actually this transgenerational inheritance concept that I want to kind of introduce this idea that we can alter the next generation through our obedience to the gospel, through our obedience to the word of God, and bringing that into real life, real time. So 42%, listen to this, 42% of the genome, 42% of the makeup of mankind it has the ability to change. It's called retrotransposin. What retrotransposing literally means is, yes, the DNA is set, but the DNA has expression that histones can be modified a whole lot greater than DNA, but these things literally can change the genome so that our ability to integrate and metabolize food could be changed, our ability to fight cancer can be adjusted, that Things that we do, you'll see things all the time. Studies say that if you eat asparagus, blah, 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 and they can do all this stuff. 
But what they're talking about is this idea that our bodies have the ability to affect next generations and our own personal generation. And I want to look at that because some of you might think this is crazy, but I kind of look at the Sabbath as a tithe. What does a tithe mean? Give me your money. <laughs> what does a tithe? What does it mean, literally? What's the literal word tithe in Hebrew mean? Tenth. Tenth. It's an amount. It's a set amount. It was first discovered in Scripture when, uh, when God saw it happen, it look, almost looked like. But I think it goes beyond that because the tenth concept, and if you want to really blow your mind, write this down on a note. Look up, just Google this, not right now, but Google it when you get home. The biological ten energy rule. The biological ten energy energy rule. That is not made up. That's not Christian. This is biology. Biology itself, from the simplest creatures on the planet all the way to mankind, operate on a 10% principle. 10% of the primary producers, the things in our planet that gain stuff directly from the sun, 10% of all the energy they create go to the next level of life. It's called the 10% rule. It's kind of interesting that the very design of God is designed on the 10%. Well, you never heard that preach. <laughs> Probably preached pretty good. The primary consumers of the initial energy producers give the next 10% of their energy to the secondary consumers and so forth until it gets to the very top. Well, who's at the very top? Man. So at the top of the pyramid, guess what God says, I want 10%, but he wants more than 10%. It's a principle, it's not money. It's a 10% principle. Actually, we decompose, for sure, and we lose energy, we give off energy and all that, and it goes back because it goes back around to the cycle. Now, so here I had a question. If, if I am correct in thinking that the universe operates on a one-tenth principle, giving, munificence, whatever, giving, then why in the world did God make the world in seven days or six days and rested on one? Why didn't he make it ten days? Because he requires one day for himself, correct? The Sabbath. The Sabbath is a tithe? No, it's one-seventh, or is it? So one of the things I started thinking about, if it's really true, there's a design in the universe that is built on 10% rule, then that should apply to the Ten Commandments, one-tenth, should apply to everything that gives energy and gives, gives glory and all that because you be on a 10% rule. So I started looking at that, wait a minute, how does this really work? Well, how many days are there in the week? And we'll do some math here. That, that was hard. <laughs> Seven times 24. I'll help you out here. 168. 168. Right? Right? Am I right? Yep. Oh, 68. Okay. 168 hours in a week. One week. One week. Now, if God required 10% of that, what would that be? 16 hours. 16.8 hours. So what's left? If you subtract 24 or subtract 16.18 from 24, what do you get? Seven hours and 12 minutes. You know what God did? In the tithe, in the Sabbath, he let you sleep. That's why I know by design it's seven hours, 7.2 hours of seven hours and 12, 12 minutes. And guess what scientists say? Seven, somewhere between seven and eight is optimal sleep. But I think it was God's design. So you know what that tells me? I like that because what that means to me, that when God commands the Sabbath, he says, I need 16.8 hours. It's one-tenth of a week. I thought, that makes sense. So what we do on the Sabbath, giving it over to God, is actually giving one-tenth of the week to him. It's a one-tenth <coughs> principle. That's the way God has designed it. That's the way he set it up. Well, why is this thing so important then? Why is sleep so important? If the design is seven hours and 12 minutes of sleep, is that really necessary then? If it's God's design, surely it's necessary for functioning life. 
So as we look through the studies that have been done and look through the things that have happened, we find out what I call Omega Optics. Omega Optics is the O in our little acronym of growth. Omega Optics is how we see God. Omega Optics is how we view the world and how our perceptions operate. And when we talk about vision or we talk about optics, we're talking about vision, how we see, how we see the purpose of the church, how we see the purpose of our life, how we, how we see God functioning and all that. So when we look at sleep, if that's really one of the things, and knowing that God has called us to that, and we're to mind the things of the Spirit, we need to understand a little bit about the genome makeup. So if you look at page 123 in your book, and I, I wrote some stuff in here. You start on page 123. I talk about the Wizard of Oz in the book. And the reason why I talk about the Wizard of Oz is because people expect certain things from church. You know, Dorothy, in the story, the, by this is the book version, not the, the movie version. The book version of the Wizard of Oz, if you remember, she, she wanted to go somewhere over the rainbow. I mean, she's always got this, I want to go somewhere else. I want to marry someone else. I want to be somebody else. You've always, always got that little wanderlust going on. And she realizes that somewhere over the rainbow actually ends up being no place like home. So in this idea of the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, her vision of what would be really great is somewhere over the rainbow. And she takes off on her little journey, and she walks with her companions down the yellow brick road. And she draws these people into her life. First of all, when she first lands in this great land, and it turns from black and white to color, if you saw the movie, she lands on the Wicked Witch, right? And then she gets the ruby slippers. Do you know in the original version, they weren't ruby at all. They were, they were clear, but it didn't look so good on color TV, and they wanted color TV to look really great, so let's do them ruby. But the point is, she put these shoes on that gave her power at any moment, at any time, to go wherever she wanted to go. She could have went back home and instantly done. But she has these shoes on, kind of like the Christian. The Christian has these gospel shoes that has the unlimited power to crush Satan under their feet, but yet does not take advantage of it. And through life, we, we collect people, companions around us, like a, a scarecrow or a tin man or, or a cowardly lion. And we get these people around us that are all looking for things in life, but they don't exactly look like what we're looking for. And so when people come to church, think about it, they're coming to church and they're trying to find the answers to life's questions. And, you know, she's wanting to go home. She wants to go back to Kansas. And, and, and you know, the, the scarecrow, he wants a brain. You know, he wants, his, wants a brain. And then you see the Tin Woodman wants a heart. And then you, she runs into the cowardly lion, and he wants gut, courage. And you see in this picture a, a, a process where the mind is looked at, like the, the brain the scarecrow's brain and the tin woodman's heart and the cowardly lion's gut or courage. And all those things are really necessary for all of them, correct? I mean, but they all have an expectation. When people come to Rockfish Church, for instance, they have an expectation. And a lot of times what they've been conditioned to do is believe that the great and powerful Oz is in the church called the leadership of the church. And in the story of the Wizard of Oz, when each of the companions meet the Wizard of Oz, they do it singularly. They only do one at a time. Dorothy comes in and sees one vision of the Wizard of Oz, and they all see something incredibly different. But in the story, when they do all these different views of this Oz, who has all the answers for all their questions, something comes out of his mouth. And he said this, before I do something for you, you need to expect that I need something from you. Before I'll do anything for you, you got to do something for me. You ever felt like that? And I'm not trying to pick on churches here, but sometimes the vision of people is, okay, you need to give us what we want. So I want a brain, I want a heart, I want gut, I want something. And then the leadership's, okay, but before you give to me, before I give to you, you need to give something to me. That's really not our job. We're really not the great and powerful Oz. We serve Jesus Christ. That's not our duty. That's not who we are. The power is already on your feet. You already have ruby slippers on. You've had this kiss on the forehead of the Holy Spirit, according to you know, what the Scripture says, that we have the seal of the Holy Spirit. We are children of the Most High God. We're here to equip one another and to get encouraged and go out and do the work. We're not here for me to try to give you courage or to hand you, you know, a heart. That comes from God. So when we look at these designs, remember, it's not for the church to give to people what they're looking for because we end up making golden calves. 
I really need to be pointing to Jesus. The brain is extremely important. The brain is extremely important, and the brain makes up one of three major parts of your mind. You know, worship God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. The brain is very, very important. So this idea of the Sabbath being a tithe, and I say you need seven hours and 12 minutes, almost tongue-in-cheek, but that's what it looks like. Seven hours and 12 minutes because of one-tenth of the week. Why is that so important? Why is it so critical that we have that in place in our lives, because having that in in place in our lives, if it's really designed by God, then it's really super, super, super important. Well, come to find out that we have recently learned, and I say recently, this is not not like when I was in high school or college even, uh, recently learned how the brain functions. The brain functions, and you can't do anything without it. I mean, obviously, there's not one thing in the mind or the brain that you could ever ever do without. You got to have it. But the, the mind and the brain, or the brain rather, is very, very sensitive. It is very, very centri- sensitive. And it, it does not do, um, I guess it doesn't do, it does a couple things. It's fighting this idea of infinity. It's fighting this, in, this idea of things winding down and I need to keep things going. It, uh, we talked about it has two particular entities in the brain that proves there's no evolution. Uh, matter of fact, one of the guys that I studied was a staunch atheist, and he, when he realized that this is really, really true, he felt like, man, there's a designer in this thing. The pondostatic nature of man, meaning that the brain controls metabolism to keep you at the weight that it wants you to be and to survive, so you're not so big you blow up or so little you disappear. I mean, I'm not talking about losing 5 or 10 pounds here. I'm talking about your general mass control is done by a part of the brain along with the thermostatic control. And those have to come together at the exact same moment in history and time for the whole thing to work. That's where he concluded that it came about by a creator and not through evolution. So he gave that up and he says, and I believe that the creator, his name is Jesus Christ. And he started reading the scripture. And if you have a pen, I will give you a bunch of scriptures you could write down and look at later. I will not have time to go through all of these, but if this is interesting to you, you know, it says things like this in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that he's blinded the minds, the blinded the minds of those people, and that's kind of a a critical thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, all the things we've been talking about from interpersonal neurobiology, from the light that's in the heart, the biophotonic nature of the heart, the face of Jesus. We haven't talked a lot about interpersonal neurobiology, but this whole idea that it's in your face that that people receive communication. Your face is connected directly to your heart, to the vagus system, and how how you can actually downregulate one another by your presence. And you can ramp people up and you can ramp them down. You can apply what they call the vagal break, or you could actually make them feel fearful through your interaction with them. But all these things go through a particular cycle in a a circuit, and it has to do with light, which is very quantum sounding, and it has to do with frequency, and it has to do with what God has done. So I'm going to write these down real quick. uh, 2 Corinthians 4, read that whole chapter. That is an incredible scripture dealing with this idea of light and how God has shown to us some incredible things in the face of Jesus. Uh, I would write that down and look at that. When you read the book, you're going to see where I talk about how the face of Jesus and what does that really mean and what does that really do? Why is the face so important? Why are the facial muscles are connected directly to the heart? The facial muscles can actually help in many ways heal people. But anyway, Ephesians 5.9, Ephesians 5.13, Philippians 2.15, sorry, Colossians one. Chapter 1, verse 12, 1 Timothy 6, 16, where God dwells in unapproachable light. James 1, 17, God is known as the Father of light. 1 Peter 2, 9. 1 John 1, 5, God is light. 1 John 1, 7. 1 John 2, 10. He says, if you love your brother, you're living in the light. Revelation 22, 5. There is no light bulbs in heaven. That's what it says. God is light. He illuminates the entire place. Some of the interpersonal neurobiology stuff is uh, ones found in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. 
1 Corinthians 14, 25, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, 13, and 18. So you probably just read that whole chapter. Um, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it's part of that too. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Real interesting ones found in 2 John 1, 12. And 3 John, which you didn't think had anything in it, 3 John 1, 14. I hope you got, if you didn't get those, I can give them to you later. I was going to go study all those with you, but you know, we would be here all day. We would just be here all day. Here's the reality. The human brain makes up part of the mind, but the human brain is a conserving organ. It's a very conserving organ. Your brain takes 20% of all the energy your body produces. Now think about your calf muscles and running and but 20% of the energy is consumed by the brain. It takes a lot. So it, your brain is, is a fascinating, fascinating piece of, of hardware, if you think of it that way. There's no computer like it. And matter of fact, I think I told you on uh, one, uh, page 123, there's a, a thousand trillion connections in your brain. A thousand trillion. So what does that really look like? Well, if you had a little disc one millimeter thick, let's tell you how, much, how many connections there are you were to stack them up on top of one another, they would go to the sun, which is 93 million miles away, and back three times over. That's the connections going on in your brain. Now, you think about how flippantly we treat our brains. I mean, think about how, you know, we put helmets on and play football. You know, we hit each over the head with stuff. You know, we, we don't think of the problems that go on, can go on with the brain. My brother's going through a tremendous amount of issues, having issues in his brain from a con several concussions. A lot of military guys, you know, you get around an explosion, and explosions do things and start, start uh, causing problems in the brain. Uh, Post-traumatic stress problems, but close-head injury problems together are really, really significant. Well, the brain is a magnificent, magnificently created organ. Most psychiatrists never look at the brain. They never look at the organ they treat. Now think about that. What do they look at? Behavior. Now I know a good psychiatrist, one I would highly recommend if people have a lot of, of issues and problems, whether it's closed head injuries or post-traumatic stress concussion type injuries. Dr. Amen is, is phenomenal in this in that he's a double board certified psychiatrist, but he, he looks at the organ. He, take, he looks at it. I mean, he's got equipment it's called a spectrum. spectrum it looks at the brain activity and blood flow real time while people are, but it's expensive and I don't know if dry care takes care of it or not, but if my kid was hurt, that's where I would go. I would go. It's Atlanta is probably the closest clinic they have, but I would, I would, I would have him look at my brain and say, what's going on? Because we have like eight, you know, before we talked about ADD and attention deficit and all that. When I was in college, there was an argument whether that even was a reality. Is that really true? Is it just goofy kids? You know, what is it? And now they know that there's like 43 different types of attention deficit, 43 different types, and the brain is always doing something different. It's not like overactive. Is it an overactive brain or is it an underactive brain? It can have the same exact behavioral response. The reason sleep is so important and why I hammer this is because of what's known as the glymphatic system of the brain. You see, your body is made up of, of lymph nodes, and lymph nodes take care of all the toxins and the breakdown, and that's how they know somebody has cancer or something. Well, in the, the video or the little slide I have up here, I drew this, by the way, so it's probably not really very accurate. Um, it's not eggs at Waffle House or nothing. It's actually what goes on inside the brain when you sleep. Because there's no lymph nodes in the brain, there is no lymph nodes. How does it get rid of its toxins? This is very important. What happens when a person goes to sleep, the area around these, the, bra the brain cells, these areas start to shrink and give you more space. They give you more space so that so the fluid, I'll just call it the fluid, you don't need to know the proper name for it, comes through the artery. There's a fluid flow that washes the brain. So you literally when you sleep, you're washing your brain. It's almost like the, you know, the filter system on a swimming pool. It washes the brain. These little things around here, these little pieces, are two substances that are very important that need to be washed out of your brain. One is tau protein, tau protein. The other one is amyloid beta. 
amyloid beta and tau protein are the two substances that are found in Alzheimer's patients and dementia. And I believe, as all researchers are showing, that when, as we know, in the next few years, Alzheimer's and dementia type activity is going to increase three to 400 percent in our culture. Three to 400 percent, what is the reason? There's all kinds of reasons. They say it's because of this, because of that. Well, it's because we're not following the designs of God. God says you need to sleep. I made you to sleep. You must sleep. Now, so when you sleep, this fluid washes through the brain and washes out tau protein and amyloid beta. Well, where does this stuff come from? Well, there's a, it's called the, the BDNF, the brain-derived neutrophic factor. Basically what happens is you lose 35,000 brain cells every day. Every day. If you're not studying French, the French ones go. Whatever. You, if you're not using it, you do lose it in your, when it comes to the brain. So what happened is 35,000 brain cells, one each time the, uh, the brain goes to sleep, it encapsulates the brain cells that are not being used. If you don't use it, it's going to reuse it. It forms an enzyme around it, it, shoots another enzyme in and chops it up. Like this, this is called pro-BDNF. Pro-BDNF is like weed killer. They can weed killer. It kills it. And then something takes place that it, when it comes apart and it breaks off, the things that are left, after because it, it takes all the protein, takes all the protein, reuses all the protein. And then it uses all this protein up, but what's left is tau protein and amyloid beta. That's what's left. It's not like it got through their true toxins. It is part of the natural function of the brain to have these chemicals, but it needs to be cleaned out. Anybody has a swimming pool, you know what happens when you put chlorine in the pool. It kills the algae. You run the pump. The pump filters out the algae. Then you backwash it. You watch the green stuff come out. The brain does the exact same thing, but the problem is if we don't sleep, it's like running the pool pump for an hour a day. I don't care how much good stuff you're doing, if you don't filter the brain, if you don't filter your pool, it will turn green. And so what's happening is because of lack of sleep, there's other things going on. There's inflammation going on. But the lack of sleep primarily is not allowing us to have our brains cleaned out. So the, the pro-BNF is, the, is the, the weed killer that chops it up. BDNF is half of that, and it's actually fertilizer. It works like fertilizer for the brain. It's really good stuff. And it is affected by your sleep. How deep do you have to sleep? We don't really know. We just know you have to stop because the organs... This brain needs to shut down. I think part of the reason why we have so many weird dreams is because all this stuff's flushing out of our brain and getting that rid of it. What it does, it flushes to the back of the brain, and the back of the brain takes it to the lymph nodes and gets rid of it. You got to sleep. So one of the protocols is restorative sleep, I call it. We've got to not violate that. <laughs>